copy of Linux, and let's say that's uh, Alpine Linux is a pretty popular lightweight uh, container version of Linux. <coughs> then you add a library as the next line in the file. That creates a separate layer. Well, when you go back and you change one of the lines in that file, it doesn't have to rebuild the entire file. It starts with the latest point at which there was a change. So it would only install the new versions of those libraries that you need. Everything else is still there. Once you have a Docker fire, Docker file, and all the layers, you can press those. Those are kind of considered your image. A tag is just a handy name for the image. And you'll see examples of some of these things. The registry, you can kind of think of like GitHub uh, or Docker images. So up in the registry, you're not going to be able to see the contents of these Docker images because they're binary. Whereas in GitHub, you would be able to see the contents. So these are kind of just places to store version images of your containers or your uh, containers. <coughs> A container is considered a running instance of an image. And then, as we mentioned before, the Docker uh, engine is the process that handles pulling images, it handles running those images, keeping them separated from individual spaces, and so forth. Again, for some of the more visual people, I prefer this method, but um, basically you have Docker build, which will take that Docker file, generate all your layers, make that into an image. Um, Docker pull pulls an image from a registry. So if you have somebody that produces images for you, you can just issue a pull command on that, and you're good to go. And then Docker run runs those. We'll see some examples of this and what hopefully will be the demo. Um, <coughs> then these typically run on a host. Uh, for people that run personal laptops, you can go to docker.com and you can actually download Docker to run on your personal computer. If you do that, uh, depending on the operating system, you get kind of a VM and you can run Docker containers within a VM inside of your computer, all completely isolated. So it's a pretty cool way to play around with this if you're interested. And then some of our standard in images, um, we'll actually take a look at Nginx tonight. And uh, there's also you know, Redis, you name it, I believe there's some ridiculous amount of real images for you. All right, so some more kind of benefits from this. Um, as far as the developer staff goes, you guys only have to worry about getting that to work on your local. That's kind of the cool thing. Once you build this on your local, the image that you build on your local is the image that makes it to production. Nowhere in that chain is that it mutable, um, can introduce things that you're not aware of. Um, it's all kind of set in stone once you commit that to the repository. Uh, you control the dependencies, which is really cool. Um, that also means being responsible and taking out the dependencies that you don't need, right? So if you update a certain uh, application and you find you no longer need certain dependencies, you can remove those. You can test them, and when it goes to production, you don't have to tell the ops guys, hey, go remove this thing, I deleted this. Um, and then the ops guys are going to complain, like, no, we can't do that because it's not enough maintenance, and all that good stuff. So you don't have to worry about that. You just push out the image, and it's prepackaged. It's ready to go. Um, you also control how it's ranked. So one of the cool things you can do with Docker containers is say, well, I've got um, a certain file system that's shared amongst all my containers. We can actually do that. So you can configure startup parameters to say, hey, I need this volume always inside of this container. And essentially, you have control of that environment. Now, I'm oversimplifying things a little bit, but in all reality, it's not terribly difficult to kind of get your head around. Anybody in OPS back here? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> um, like DevOps? No? No? Okay, well, then I'm the only one that cares about this side, I guess. But the cool thing for your operations teams is that they no longer have to worry about making sure 
and that your release task is followed to the nth degree in the proper order, and that's going to make your clients happy, right? Whether that's internal, external, that's a big benefit for everybody. We don't care what's inside of it. Well, we kind of care what it, what's inside of it. If you're hosting like tour sites and, and inside of our Docker containers, you probably wouldn't like that. But um, for the most part, we don't care if you've got an API exposed in there, if you're running some nightly process, it doesn't matter. We spin up a container, we run it, we call it a day, right? Um, so really, from the operation side, you're kind of separating those things and saying you no longer have to worry about um, watching that uh, server to the nth degree. You basically prepackage a server image, deploy it, and then run Docker containers on it. So it's relatively, relatively simple. All right, I debated about trying to do this live, but I will, I tested it, I swear it works. So we'll try to see a little bit about what happens when we use Docker containers, and hopefully it works. What's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? That's a good question. What's going to happen? nothing. So, first of all, we're going to start with something that's prepackaged. We're going to get into the .NET portion of this a little bit later after we see this. But just so we can kind of get a feel for how these things run, what we have to do is start with that. So, yeah. so the first command that's of interest here is basically Docker images. Basically, this is a list of any image that you have on your computer. Pretty simple, right? Bump up the, uh, the text size. Oh, control box. Uh, yep. Cool. Double better. Yeah. Double better. For anybody interested, I'm actually doing this inside of the VM on my Mac, so um, that's why this looks a little bit different. So Docker images. All right, let's start with Nginx. Everybody familiar with what Nginx is or heard of it? Basically, just a very lightweight web server. All right, and I want to run that on my local here. So remember from a previous slide, we had this pool command. And yeah, it's actually just that easy. Now, you can see here that it's actually downloading a number of different layers onto my computer. And it actually did three different layers. So this is kind of the idea of what you see inside the Docker file. They have a Docker file. It starts out with a base Linux distribution of some sort. It adds maybe some dependencies onto it, and then it installs Nginx. Pretty lightweight. But if they update the version of Nginx, I only have to download one of those layers now, because the other two are Linux and maybe their dependencies. So that's kind of the nice thing about Docker containers, is you're never downloading the entire thing after you pull that initial image. So that's good. That's the first part of the demo that actually worked. Um, now, just for the warm, fuzzy feeling, we can go take a look at Docker images and see that we can Pretty cool. Uh, we can see, here's a tag, latest. So we saw that vocabulary in an earlier slide. That means that this is the latest version of this, this image. What's cool is all this stuff is version. So if I want to go back to a previous version, i.e. I release something to production and it goes kaboom, I can roll back to a previous image and nobody knows. Well, maybe not everybody, but few people know. The other thing you can take a look at is the size of these things. So what's the default install on Windows OS? Like 40 gigs? No, 32. 182 megabytes. Yeah, that's actually ridiculously small. So when you talk about downloading images, running them, very small. And even in the, the .NET Core image that we'll see later is also relatively small. So basically, uh, that's it for getting an image onto your computer. Now let's start that up. So. We can show any running container with the ps command. And it kind of wraps around here because the output is pretty long. 
but this shows any currently running containers on my computer. Cool. So let's start up Nginx. So we already got the image. Now, if you have the image beforehand and you issue this command, it will actually download it for you. So you don't have to take an extra step. I just did it to kind of show how you would do that. Super eventful, right? Awesome. All we got is some random numbers. <coughs> well, if we look at our running command here again, we see, oh, hey, I've got a container that's running. See? It's not that bad, right? Well, kind of. Um, here's the problem with this. So, okay, well, we see it's using 480, right? That's awesome. Let's do this. Can't get to our container, right? That actually brings a point up about Docker. Docker creates isolated environments. And that means they are completely isolated. Nothing outside of that container is allowed to do anything unless you specifically tell it to. So let's tell it to. So basically, to operate on containers, you can use the name. Um, you can also, oh, I didn't put it in this one, but basically you use the container ID as far as manipulating containers. So let's use the rm command. If anybody's a Linux guy, you know rm-f is usually a bad thing, but here it's okay. And you don't have to type out the entire container ID if there's only one container that starts with 0, 05, or 0 for that matter. You only have to type in 0. I do not recommend doing that though, because you're going to be on the production box someday, and you're going to do rm f0, and you're going to blow away half of your training instances. So I would recommend not doing that. Um, the safer command here is docker stop, and then you can docker rm, because uh, the f goes ahead and shuts down that container too, all in one step for you. So be careful with that. Um, now let's get this to do something useful. Uh, let's try this. Cool. I can specify dash p, and that's going to say I'm going to expose port 80. That's how I get something from inside my container outside. So if you're running a little API or something inside of your container, you can expose whatever port that's running on, and you're going to be all set. Right? Maybe. Still doesn't work, right? And this is on purpose. I swear. <coughs> Let's take a look at this command again. You'll notice something here um, at the end. And it's actually a little bit cut off here, so let's do... So down here at the bottom, you see this 0.0.0.0.0.32768, right? What Docker does is when you tell it to expose a port, it doesn't necessarily give you the port that you're wanting, unless you specifically specify. So what port was this? Uh, 32768. Hey, there we go. That's kind of what we were expecting. There's a very good reason for Docker just wanting to pick its own arbitrary port. Although you might think it's a little weird. It's actually a pretty good idea considering you're never in production going to have just one of these containers ever spun up on your server, right? What happens if I've got two of these containers running on my server and they're both trying to get 480? You're going to have a bad day, right? So, what it does by default is just share some um, random port. Uh, you can specify the range if you want to get into the Docker configs and all that stuff. Uh, it'll just 
specify some random port to let you get into it. Okay. You can also you can also fix it to a port. So if you say port 8080 colon 80, it's going to say take the internal port 80 and expose it on port 8080 to the outside world. So then during development, you're not racking your brain changing the port number every 10 minutes and getting frustrated. So here we go. Port 8080, same thing, works. So a couple things to note there is make sure you've got the right ports exposed. I'm not going to get into how to expose file systems and all that sort of thing. I'll let that up to an exercise for you guys. Um, but here's kind of an example of how you would get just a container running. So let's clean up here a little bit. Uh, Docker PS. So if you try to do a Docker RM to remove a container and it's not stopped, it's going to be nice and let you know that it's not a good idea to just randomly remove a running container. So you can do docker stop uh, and that's going to stop the container and now you can go back up and remove the container and it's not compliant. So that's probably the way that I would recommend doing that in production, not necessarily for the purposes of any questions on that? Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that once you stop it, you can start it back up as well whenever? You can, yes. <laughs> typically, though, with containers, you typically don't care. Um, you make these containers so they start up the same every time, and they have the same life cycle every single time you run them. So if you're going to stop them and then start them up again, you're kind of getting outside of the idea of what it, Container is necessarily for, but it is actually doable. And if you're debugging something, certainly a, a way to deal with those. Typically, you just want to remove them and start up a new one. Yeah. Is Amazon building you per container or the by processing power and everything still? We haven't actually even gotten to the Amazon part of this. Okay. this is Sorry, all free. I'm trying to, I didn't mean to jump ahead. No, 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 not at all. It's a good point. This is all free. All, all you have to do is go download the Docker daemon on your local computer and uh, at the end of this, I'll have the GitHub repo where you can just run all these commands for you. So you won't get charged for any of that unless you actually run things up in production. That's a good point, thank you. All right, so one demo down and out of the way. Now, let's talk about .NET Core. So I know you guys had a talk a couple months ago about .NET Core and how to work with that, right? Pretty interesting stuff that Microsoft did open sourcing it, and I think the community is going to get a lot of benefit from open sourcing it. 